Morning, everyone. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit further about what Ma'am has started about how to get wound uh, healing. And the important thing to remember is that we function well when all that she was talking about, which is all going on in the background, functions perfectly. So everything that we do is only going to be as useful as the basic wound healing system. It's like trying to uh, drive a car. You could drive uh, a regular car, you could drive a race car, you could drive a jet. And depending on how the system functions inside, your results will be there. If there is any problem with the wound healing uh, underlying mechanisms, irrespective of how uh, well you plan your procedures or how well your uh, technical skills may be, you are not going to get anywhere. So it's vital that you make sure that as far as possible, oftentimes you may not be able to pick out the uh, problems underlying in wound healing, but if you uh, can, you will try and make sure that you make sure that everything is in order before you start your procedure. This is our team at Ramchandra Medical College and special thanks to the people who directly and closely work with me, Professor Ramesh, Dr. Uh, Singarwale and uh, Dr. Abhirami and our postgraduates, uh, Dr. Akshata, Dr. Sagar and Dr. Preeti. So skin cover, we're going to talk about it in two components. First, we'll talk about what we traditionally do as plastic surgeons. This is something that all of us uh, practice, and uh, especially in the Indian uh, context, a lot of our work stems from ability to uh, cover the defects and to uh, heal up uh, wounds, whether it's trauma or after cancer resection, or any congenital uh, deficits. So it's uh, predominantly skin cover that we are uh, dealing with. And this is work that you don't have to go searching for. This is work that comes to you. And uh, often people have no other choice but to uh, deal with this. And uh, for, for one example, major burns, okay, this is uh, something that you may not always be able to uh, cover, but at least you can provide some tender love and care. And if you have a burn like this, deep full thickness burns, you know for sure that this is not going to settle unless you intervene. So you'd want to take from unburnt areas, you harvest a skin graft, try and cover this, try and get this done as early as possible before infection uh, sets in. Many times, it's not just the skin cover that is uh, needed. You'll have to look at other components. For example, this was a wound on the chest wall. You can actually see the uh, lung moving across there. This was onto the diaphragm. The, that's the lining uh, into going into the peritoneal uh, cavity. And before you think in just in terms of wound cover there, you've got to make sure that you have the underlying processes all sorted out before you uh, plan just the uh, cover. Uh, this was a wound that was going right down into the uh, brain. So you need to make uh, sure that uh, the GCS is all right, your regular uh, airway breathing, circulation, disability, exposure. So just don't go by what you uh, think is the uh, most eye-catching uh, problem of the lot. For example, uh, here we as problem solving specialty are often called to uh, assistance in wound healing by other specialties. This was a uh, post uh, CABG wound that had problems with healing. So the media stenum was still mobile. You can see uh, some non uh, viable uh, cartilage and bone there. So you've got to make sure that all that is uh, sorted before you can think in terms of the uh, skin cover. Okay. In areas like this, sometimes you get calls from a &E saying there's a large wound. Can the plastic surgeons uh, be involved to provide for skin cover? You might actually find that it's not skin cover that they need, but perhaps an amputation, major wounds like this, a lot of uh, muscle uh, damage. It may in fact be detrimental to the person to attempt to uh, salvage. So you've got to make sure that uh, a good liaison is there between the orthopedic surgeon and the plastic surgeon. 
and you can decide immediately whether that limb is worth uh, salvaging or whether the person would be better served with an amputation. Okay, this is a child, a newborn, defect in the skull, uh, de defect uh, resulting from, from a congenital aplasia cutis. So it's not just the skin cover, but the calvarium as well that needs to be sorted. A gentleman with a train traffic accident, you can see that he's got some form of stabilization. You can see the external fixator uh, rods there. You can see some wires across there, but he still has a little bit of infection. He still has some necrotic tissue and slough. So you've got to make sure that the wound bed is optimized and ready before you think in terms of coverage. Otherwise, irrespective of what flap you might plan for that, that's all going to float away in a sea of purulent exudate. Do you always need a plastic surgeon or uh, coverage, not particularly. As Ma'am was saying, all wounds eventually heal, just like all bleeding eventually stops. But the kind of uh, ultimate result that that might cause will be far from optimal, not something that the uh, person may like. This uh, young girl had uh, just conservative management of her uh, burns on the anterior chest wall and the neck, and you literally see the momentum going uh, right down onto the uh, st sternum. So even to intubate here, you will have problems. You might need to release the uh, postman contracture under a local anesthetic before you can think in terms of intubation. This again, no intervention, uh, perhaps not even adequate dressings. The raw area on the hand and forearm was kept in close contact with the uh, chest wall. And you see the amount of, you, you can, on the one hand, marvel at the amazing ability of the human body to heal. And at the same time, feel sad that irrespective of the best of reconstructive efforts that can be offered, you're not going to be able to get much of useful function in this uh, upper limb at this point in time. Sometimes, in spite of our efforts, this was a child who had a, a thigh flap for the uh, dorsal uh, foot defect done elsewhere. Few problems with the uh, flap inset and healing, ultimately resulting in a poor quality wound cover. And especially in children, as they are growing, you see the amount of inelastic uh, tissue that will cause the deformity to get accentuated as these kids uh, grow up. We were just talking about the malignant chain. So if you have an unstable uh, scar, so quite often seen on extensor aspects, flexor sides, you see the contractures, the extensor sides, wound breakdown, you can end up with the malignant uh, change. Do you always need to do something about it? Perhaps not. This uh, lady who had a pressure cooker uh, burst onto her face, had steam scalds, all we needed to do was to clean up all the uh, blistered skin, dress it well. And she was actually quite pleased and her uh, spouse as uh, well that the fine righted wrinkles on her face had gone away. She was actually looking a few years younger and prettier than prior to the accident. Do you always need fancy uh, stuff? Perhaps not as well. I apologize. It seems to be doing uh, this running away, but... Uh, all we needed to do was to replace the parts of this uh, zigzag and you can see that ultimately we just needed a little additional skin graft in places where uh, some of that skin had lost its vascularity. Okay. Sometimes that's all that is needed. A uh, dramatic looking defect healed with just straightforward suturing. Most of it primarily healed. This was an innocuous looking uh, area with just a small bit of plate exposed uh, on the uh, face. Unfortunately, this lady had a lytic lesion of the mandible, which was resected and replaced with just the plate. And so to re uh, get that, uh, this was uh, what uh, she had. So to get this result, we needed to do a free fibula uh, flap to provide the bone that was missing with a little skin paddle to uh, cover up over the cutaneous defect that she's had. Sometimes the skin may be there, but it's not something that you would like, a skin that is either potential to cause issues because of the possibility of malignant change or skin that is not 
good in appearance. This little girl was quite unhappy with it. She's one of twins and a uh, very bright uh, child, but uh, was not very keen initially to go to school because of the uh, torment she uh, had from her uh, schoolmates. So we used uh, self-expanding tissue expanders, a couple of them to try and uh, spread out the skin from the uh, forehead region and from the mastoid and uh, cheek region to try and achieve a reasonable uh, defect, a reasonable outcome for her. Okay, so this is what we always try to do. We don't just go by the wound per se. You assess the area and the patient before deciding on what uh, best. This is how we always do it. This has been grilled into our heads for decades, ever since the 40s, and all of us are aware of it. And this is also something that uh, we know from the World War days that if you can't uh, close up a wound uh, directly, rather than use heavy sutures to try and pull tissues and then find that your direct closure has fallen apart, maybe try and put a graft. And then if the graft doesn't take because the bed is not vascularized enough, going up the ladder, we, we always stress on the fact that we have to use the reconstructive elevator. And yes, if we do have a simple solution, we would take that. But if it needs a complex procedure to achieve the best possible result, we would not hesitate to use the reconstructive elevator. Okay. Now, we have a few additional things in our armamentarium. We'll talk about this towards the later part of the talk. And that's the role of specialized uh, dressings, negative pressure wound therapy, and the role of dermal matrices. Everything else remains the same. We still have the ability to use whatever we need as the first uh, choice. But some of these additional components has made life so much easier for, for us. Okay, So this is the best kind of uh, wound healing that we can offer as uh, plastic and microsurgeons. If there is an amputation, you know that there is a skin wound, you want to heal this. And what better way to do it than this is what God meant to be in that area. If uh, chance or fate has taken it off, we can help as uh, plastic surgeons by putting it back, doing a replant. So irrespective of the uh, part that's uh, come off, the more distal you go, technically it's a little bit more challenging, but you have time on your side. The more proximal you go, you have to be quick, but the advantage is that the vessel size and uh, the uh, uh, ability for these vessels to have more pressure and to have a reasonable uh, pressure head, make sure that these uh, tissues survive. The difficulty will always lie with the amount of muscle that is there in an amputated portion and how much of a warm ischemia time has uh, taken place, okay? So, uh, ma'am spoke about all this, so I want to touch on that, the epithelization, contraction, and connective tissue formation. Our hope is that we get all our wounds to heal by primary intention. Occasionally, if the wound is uh, dirty, infected, they present late, we might want secondary intention, tertiary intention, but we would perhaps try and avoid healing of wounds by secondary uh, intention. Okay, so this is going up the ladder from primary closure to uh, grafts, local flaps, or free tissue uh, transfer. And we know from the pictures that you've seen and from uh, the way tissues they heal, life has taught us that if you want a person to be, remain alive, especially in major burns, all you need to do is to just provide the epidermis. So cell suspensions and uh, cultured keratinocytes will help us do that. But if you do not have uh, dermis, that scar is going to be very unstable, that epidermis is going to shear away with the minimum amount of uh, trauma. So dermis is what provides quality of life to that particular area of uh, skin uh, regeneration. So I won't go through this. We are all aware of the various kinds of flaps that are available in an armamentarium. And this is what we would normally do as plastic surgeons. We know if there's something bad, this is a basal cell carcinoma. We excise it, get a flap, 
we go through all our other uh, options. We think in terms of would just uh, skin graft be okay? Would uh, full thickness graft uh, suffice? Would we want better quality uh, tissue? We don't want any contraction and ectropy on there. We don't want any sagging. We don't want anything too bulky across uh, there. So we try and go through all the options that we have and decide what is the best in a particular situation. Another example of a Limburg flap, a Webster periolar advancement. So even in a malignancy, irrespective of it's not just we want to do aesthetic reconstructive surgery as much as uh, possible. We want to give uh, scars that are well uh, settled and preferably hidden in natural creases. This is a titanium mesh exposed on a play person who had a recurrent sinonasal uh, carcinoma. She's just a few weeks uh, down the line. In these kind of uh, situations, it may look pretty uh, daunting, but a simple option of uh, local uh, scalp flap, we at least could make sure that she has enough hair bearing skin. Being a lady, she would be able to uh, grow her hair and cover the uh, bald uh, patch. Our uh, role uh, in the malignancy would be immediately to get quick cover. She is uh, due for radiotherapy as well. So we want a quick, well-settled flap uh, for this person. Okay. Two defects, one proximal tibia, one or the mid shaft, literally extending to the distal shaft, infected, pus pouring. So we had to do debridements, had to uh, utilize the negative pressure dressings to try and get the wound healthy and then a gastroc flap and a local distally based fascia cutaneous flap was enough to cover that area. Okay. Occasionally, just coverage may not be sufficient. For example, this is a BCC on the eyelid, full thickness lower eyelid uh, loss. So we needed to have a conjunctival reconstruction with buccal mucosa and then a skin flap for uh, coverage. Our aim would be to make sure that the scars are good and that you do not have any problems with vision. So you want complete closure and uh, no issues when the eye opens out as well. Again, person with trauma, periorbital injury. You can see the amount of tissue that is necrose, sloughing off. All that needs to be debrided in the first instance a tarsal conjunctival flap from the upper eyelid in this particular case for the uh, lower eyelid coverage. The rest of the areas all covered with a full thickness graft. This is her in the interim period while the tarsal conjunctival flap settles. That is division, leaving some extra mucosa so that there is no uh, skin that can potentially rub against the cornea. And I'm sorry, this slide should have been earlier. That was a full thickness graft. And that's uh, her. No eyelashes, but you can uh, see that she has complete lid uh, closure and the upper eyelid is still able to function uh, well. Okay, this was the person that we saw initially a bilateral pectoralis major, myocutaneous advancement flap. Uh, this uh, slide is nearly two decades old. This was at the time when the terminology of a propeller hadn't come into an island fascia cutaneous uh, flap. So the donor site was grafted uh, here and that's the extent of the flap on a single uh, perforator. Malignancies, recurrent, you can see some prior grafts there, just a simple gluteal uh, rotation flap. This was a recurrent uh, carcinoma over the uh, shoulder an LD myocutaneous uh, my muscle flap with graft uh, on it, a converse flap for a post auricular reconstruction. So oftentimes it's not just the cover that we want. We could very easily have just trimmed it and then uh, stitched up the two uh, areas of skin after getting the cartilage off. But if you want a better quality reconstruction, this would help even though it is staged. This is a lady with a CA breast with a pedicled uh, tram flap, another example of the same. Often we don't have enough tissues. We may not be able to do a single stage procedure, in which case we can opt for a distant direct flap, a groin flap for a dorsal hand defect, same picture, or a cross arm flap. This was what we were traditionally uh, using. Yes, it does make it difficult for the uh, patient, 
to have these kind of stage procedures in the intervening period, whether it's a groin flap or a cross arm flap, there's limitation of movement. You can have stiffness of uh, joints. The uh, dressings are difficult to uh, manage. And uh, subsequently, in, in, instead of having these stage procedures, with the advent of uh, microvascular surgery, we started using the uh, free tissue transfers more often, a dorsal uh, foot defect, which needed tendon reconstruction. So we could use uh, anterolateral thigh flap, harvest the local facial data as well, so that you could reconstruct the extensor tendons simultaneously. This was a uh, Indian closet injury where an attempt was made for TA uh, repair, the skin and the uh, TA uh, dehised, and there was a lot of uh, necrotic uh, tendon and slug. So all that was taken off. This was an ALT flap with vascularized fasciolata for uh, tendo Achilles reconstruction. And this is uh, just a couple of shan spins and uh, K-wire on the metatarsal head region to serve as an elevation uh, column to avoid pressure and protect the uh, flap and the anastomosis uh, here while this uh, tissue was uh, healing up. Well, you could argue that you could use a plaster of Paris, but this is uh, quite a robust way and makes sure that you don't have uh, sleepless nights wondering whether there's any movement of the ankle which could rip your anastomosis off or whether there's any pressure induced problems to your uh, flap. Okay, So this is something that we've started using more uh, often, free tissue uh, tra transfers for uh, coverage of defects. This is again an anterolateral thigh flap for an elbow uh, defect. This was a person who had an issue with the custom mega processes that had to be taken off and spanned with the knee spanning external fixator. There was a wound over the uh, proximal part of the leg, half of the leg literally with bone uh, missing there. So we had uh, LD myocotinous flap that was anastomos uh, distally. And once the flap settled, the processes went back and once the infection was all controlled. Okay. Pediatric aid groups as well, they tend to do fairly well. The size of the vessels are small, but uh, they have no comorbids. And as long as you uh, get uh, the uh, technical components of your procedure right, you end up with uh, good results. And the advantage being that having a good uh, flap, the ability of that uh, tissue to grow and stretch along with the child is there and you do not have the problems with uh, secondary deformities uh, developing. If a component is lost and you want something to replace, in this case, this gentleman presented uh, about a week uh, later with uh, a thumb loss and he just wanted one operation. So we had, uh, he did not want a sequential procedures to cover and then a toe transfer. So we uh, opted for a primary toe to uh, thumb uh, transfer for him. Okay, It's important as we are talking about the fact that you need to make sure that your wound bed is optimized. If they present early, we do uh, have a good uh, debridement and we use pulse lavage uh, as well, uh, which our orthopedic surgeons often uh, have for the knee replacement. So we make sure that the wound is optimally debrided, muscle flap or cover, so that we could have a, a good uh, reconstruction and make sure that we don't end up with an amputation. The newer forms of therapy that are available in the sense that these are not as popular in our country, okay, but we do have some godsend maggots in wounds, which are not always bad. It's the bacterial uh, uh, look, uh, uh, harbingers, which come along with the maggots that we are unhappy with. So if you could have blowfly uh, maggots, which are uh, being raised in a sterile environment, you could use it for wound uh, debridement and hence hasten the bed and make it ready for uh, coverage. Okay? You need to make sure that it's covered with a semi-permeable membrane. And uh, this uh, really has uh, helped because as surgeons, we like to see bleeding before we know that the wound bed is uh, healthy. 
but these are pure sacrifages they will only you eat up uh, dead tissue so you can make sure that uh, the wound bed is quickly optimized and it's fairly pain free the only thing is you've got to get over the idea that uh, you have uh, maggots uh, creeping all over your uh, wound so some patients do refuse but if not this is a good way of quickly optimizing a wound bed for graft the one uh, kind of dressing that we are very fond of using and which uh, plays a major role in helping us with wound coverage uh, now is negative pressure therapy we all know of the advantages of it there are multitudes of companies which offer this some of us opt to use Uh, what is available in uh, house the advantage with negative pressure is that till your wound is ready for cover those few days even in uh, acute uh, wounds it helps minimize contamination of the wound helps migration of bacteria up the neurovascular bundles and hence makes your subsequent surgery even if it is a uh, microvascular makes the pedicle dissection that much more comfortable there is less uh, induration around the uh, blood vessels as you dissect uh, through so it's a good interim uh, procedure before you finally decide on flap cover and in certain uh, situations you can buy uh, a lot more time with negative pressure wound therapy than you can with conventional uh, dressings okay this is for a foot wound this was a wound that you ultimate just grafted and the advantage with negative pressure other than making sure that the bed doesn't uh, deteriorate rapidly is that it's a very secure form of immobilizing a graft using the suction and hence it can optimize graft take as well the role of hyperbaric oxygen we do uh, have lots of centers where hyperbaric therapy is available uh, now but the difficulty is in patient transport to those particular areas and it's really not caught on on a, in a big way it does need time there are certain situations perhaps in a person where you optimally deprived you still have some anaerobic uh, organisms or if it's on a borderline and you want to improve the uh, dissolved oxygen in the plasma then this is uh, a good uh, way but uh, otherwise in regular uh, use it doesn't seem to uh, have caught on very uh, much so you can see the time frame between these uh, two many months to try and get and even now the wound is not uh, great so perhaps hyperbaric oxygen has a role in optimizing the wound while we get a stable uh, cover okay what has really helped the uh, current uh, new kid on the block at least as far as uh, our country is concerned is the dermal substitutes that's been available now for a little over a year now it's been available in the overseas market for nearly 3 uh, decades and so its role is well established but it's something that is uh, caught on in a big way uh, just recently and the advantage uh, that we have now with it is we are able to optimize and cover wounds especially if you don't need much bulk and if there are other situations where you can you can't offer the kind of flap cover that you would like to this seems to be a very uh, simple and straightforward way of achieving wound cover and in certain situations it's perhaps even better than the flaps that we would traditionally offer okay dermal matrix the one that is uh, fairly popular and available in our country is the dermal matrix from integra life sciences okay this is a bilayer uh, matrix where you do need to replace the skin uh, epidermal component at a later point in time once the dermal component vascularizes and we usually tend to dress it with a silver based uh, dressing and if feasible cover it with negative pressure therapy so the silicon layer and the dermal matrix uh, layer there are some people who use it even just for improvement of the scars this was a, a lady who had grafting uh, done at the time of a primary burn this was done way back in 2003 she was aware of the role of uh, idrt we imported it from uh, us and she had a bit of tightness across the joints 
and she was quite happy with even though it's not replacing like with like the reconstruction was better it's much more uh, supple freedom of movement in the joints and she seemed to prefer it to the uh, autographs that she's uh, had so uh, she wanted more areas uh, dealt with as well but it's still not going to be as good as replacing it with your own uh, uh, skin so if it's possible this wo uh, was a boy who uh, had a hypertrophic scarring bordering uh, on uh, a keloidal formation over the cheek and this was after a tissue expansion so uh, this would be the uh, optimum way certain situations when you offer free tissue uh, transfer as well this was a post traumatic uh, scar across the entire posterior aspect of the leg right from the popliteal fossa which had a bit of contracture and the ankle joint with the ta contracture as uh, well so this ideally would have needed a, a long uh, skin flap the parents were not keen and this was a child so we wanted to make sure that after release we could do something to help with uh, prevention of the contracture coming back so she had a ta release through a slightly lateral incision to get the equinus subsequently the scar near the ankle and the popliteal fossa was uh, released and covered with uh, a dermal matrix that was uh, stapled through you can see contrary to what we normally like to see as plastic surgeons we like to see a red tissue the granulation that ma'am was mentioning before we put a graft on in uh, integra it seems to work just the reverse initially with a little bit of blood soakage it's all red but as it vascularizes it becomes peachy uh, cream uh, uh, colored peachy in appearance and uh, once it's vascularized it's fairly easy for the silicone layer to be peeled off in the initial stages when it's fresh when it's before it gets vascularized it's very difficult to get the silicone layer which is quite adherent uh, to it there are two components uh, either a meshed or a non meshed so depending on what your wound bed status is you can opt for either of those two you can actually this is not something that is often seen but you can see a little bit of blanching uh, here normally we do not expect blanching and you don't expect any bleeding over the uh, integra when you rub it uh, as well as long as it's uh, got the silicone layer that's peeling off easily you will be happy to go ahead initially in the 90s we were uh, using very thin uh, epidermal autograft now we like to use a little bit of a dermis as well the ultimate reconstruction seems to fare better if you use a thin uh, splattering of dermis along with the epidermis when you are putting the uh, graft and that's the same uh, child with a straight uh, knee and uh, ankle okay. so this is again is something that we were not uh, thought during our plastic surgical days and we were told if there's exposed bone or exposed uh, tendon devoid of its vascular covering the periosteum or the peritoneum uh, a small amounts would be able to be uh, bridged with a graft but otherwise that was a definite and strong indication for a, a flap cover uh, now we see things uh, differently i'll show you some examples this is a diabetic foot with some areas of tendon exposure on the uh, dorsum the sloughy tendons which are uh, dead are obviously uh, debrided and then over the remaining uh, tendon which looks reasonable obviously in a tendon you don't expect much bleeding but if you were to bridge it with uh, integra you find that the integra being non viable acellular stays there for a while gets vascularized and then the vascularity is able to bridge and connect over the uh, tendon and subsequently when you come to peeling the uh, silicone layer off you find that your tendons are now covered by vascular tissue and the bed will subsequently accept a graft 